Now, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest, we've had him, we've had him many times on the show down through the years, and we have totally and completely enjoyed him. We've laughed with him, we've cried with him, and he's always worth a good turn. Would you welcome, please, our old friend, Neil Tobin. Neil, you're welcome. <laughs> Neil Tobin. <laughs> Good evening. My name is immaterial. I'm an ordinary Dublin individual and consequently wish to remain anonymous as we are an endangered species. I have the honour to deliver the inaugural Gay Borden Millennium Lecture. <laughs> From now on, this lecture will be delivered every thousand years <laughs> by an ordinary Dublin individual subject to availability. <laughs> Gay Borden is a Democrat. He is passionately believes in free speech. He passionately believes in free everything. <laughs> And after damn near 40 years of getting everything for nothing, <laughs> his greatest achievement came when the Dublin Corporation thrown in the towel and said, ah, here, have the fucking city. <laughs> the team of my lecture is great poems of the millennium. <laughs> now, I don't have time to recite them all, <laughs> but I have chosen to. Number one, The Dancer, by Anonymous. <laughs> Michael Flatley, Lord of the Dance, is the feast for feminine eyes but from constantly busting the front of his pants, he is also the Lord of the Flies. <laughs> Home number two, the Sportsman, also by Anonymous. Rumours of nasal sex have Anfield on its toes. Why else would Robbie Fowler wear a condom on his nose? <laughs> now, thank you for your attention. That was the lecture. <laughs> now, um, obviously, people don't follow Liverpool very closely, but anyway, they would have understood that better if they had. Uh, we have an election coming up, we have two elections coming up, which means that we are in for an unprecedented outbreak of orthodontal mendacity with concomitant rectal verbosity, <laughs> which means lying through your teeth while talking through your arse. <laughs> but before we leave the politics, I want to say something about the people who are involved in the peace process and so on and how we wish them all well and we are very, very impressed by what they do and we very moved by it, but I sometimes wonder if people, especially from the other side of the water, understand how deep are the divisions that go through Irish society, not just human society, but indeed animal society, the beasts of the field, the very fowl of the farmyard. Because did you know that there are such things as Republican hens <laughs> and orange hens? <laughs> oh yes, there are. You go into a farmyard and you'll see a caucus of Republican hens there in the corner, colloguing, saying, Chuck, 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 chucky, chucky, alarm! <laughs> chucky, alarm! <laughs> While the orange hens go, Fuck off! <laughs> so... I have been asked to supply a few of the jokes with which I have had the privilege of subverting the good taste of the Irish nation over the last few decades. And my own favourite Dublin joke unquestionably is not a joke at all, it's a true story, a true Dublin incident. 
Dublin, of course, being the very home of indignation. A Dublin man would rather be indignant than happy any day to be. <laughs> and the best example of this is the man who was cycling home for his lunch one day, and he was coming down past Tara Street, Fire Brigade Station, and he saw men running around with hoses and shinning up and down ladders carrying out fire drills. So he got down off at the bike, and he looked on fairly approvingly at all this activity until someone pulled a wrong lever and a jet of water shot out of the hose, hit him in the chest, sent him spinning across the street and left his bike in a tangled mass in the middle of the roadway. So he got up, wiped himself down, looked at the fireman and said, Jesus, you wouldn't do it to me if I was on fire. <laughs> and, um, My favourite Kerry story, of course, is the teacher who had two little boys from the same family, two brothers, obviously, from the, from the same family, <laughs> in his class. And he was very puzzled by the fact that they never arrived in school together. One was always a few minutes later than the other. And uh, one morning, uh, this puzzled him, but one morning when one of them actually uh, came a little late, he was the first to arrive, but he was still a bit late, and he said, he said, you're late, what kept you? He said, I was having my breakfast. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Must have been a fine breakfast to keep you late for school. What did you have for your breakfast? I had a boiled egg. <laughs> oh, I see. All right, sit down, sit down. So five minutes later, the other brother arrived, and he said, Oh, you decided to come to school. Very nice to have you with us. And tell me, <laughs> what kept you? You're late. I was having my breakfast. <laughs> I see. And what did you have for your breakfast? I had a boiled egg. He said, your brother had a boiled egg. He could be here five minutes ago. Had I a spoon? Had I? <laughs> there were two men drinking in a New York bar, one at either end of this very, very long bar counter. And there was nobody else in the bar except the barman. And uh, one guy squinted off along the length of the counter and said, you know what, there's some, there's some shocking Irish looks about you. He said, what's that effect? Well, you should get a prize for that. I have red hair and freckles and blue eyes and a broken nose and you think I look Irish. Oh, oh Sherlock Holmes is alive and well and drinking in Manhattan. <laughs> There's no need to be so bloody sarcastic. I know damn well you're Irish. What? I'm Irish myself, you know. Jesus, you don't see eh, you know. <laughs> and what part of Ireland do you come from? So none of your bloody business. No, come on, where are you? I come from Mayo. You come from Mayo? Jesus, I come from Mayo too. What part of Mayo do you come from? Culture Mark, I suppose. Culture Mark, me, yes. I come from Cashel Bear. Oh, Jesus, I come from Cashel Bear too. What hell of cash do you come from? And just then the phone rang and the barman picked it up and said, Oh, hi, boss. No, no, it's very quiet. Yeah, just the usual bullshit. <laughs> the Rowan twins are pissed again. <laughs> <laughs> Inevitably, if I stand up in public, people expect some reference to the county of Carvin. So we might as well get the poor holes out of the misery and stuff. And the, there was a, a long-running dispute as to who would come out the winner in a contest of wits between the cute cock whore and the main calf and bastards. <laughs> And this was finally solved over a game of golf. Now, the result of the golf is immaterial, but it was played between a corkman and a cavalryman, obviously. And when they came in, they went, leaving the 18th green, the cavalryman was sort of hurrying towards the locker room, and the corkman said, Hey, hold on, I shall hurry. You, know, you never appeared to your caddy. I mean, the caddy has to live, too. You know, you have to... He said, Oh, God, yeah, did you like? He said, uh, Well, you know, I, I, I left my wallet in the locker room. I tell you what, you fix up the caddy and I'll fix up the Juliet on. Is that all right? Okay, film up, film up. So, later on, the cockman came out of the, the shawl with the towel around his uh, belly and um, the cockman said, did you, did you fix the caddies? Oh, I did, yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, I gave me one for the 20 quid and I gave you one for the 50p. You gave me for the 50p? 
She might as well give him nothing as give him 50p. Oh, no, because if I give him nothing, he might think you forgot. Now he knows you're a mean bastard. <laughs> and... <laughs> All right, there's only two more. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's a habit among mothers in cities all over the world that on a Saturday they give their children something to help them with their movements through life. Some of them give them Glauber salts or Epsom salts and they should all be put in prison. But there are others who give you things like uh, California syrup of figs, from which we get the song, California, here I go. <laughs> well, there was one mother in Belfast and she favoured castor oil above all other remedies. She thought castor oil was terrific. It was second hand, it was great, you know. So she used to give the little boy uh, castor oil, but one morning she went looking for him. He was out in the street playing football, so she called him, Sammy, Sammy, come on in and take castor oil. Well, not. Come in, I'm not coming in, I don't want her to hear it. I'm not coming in. She said, if you don't come in, come, come in and take your castor oil. I'm not coming in, I don't want her to hear it. If you don't come in and take your castor oil, I'll tell your father, you know what he'll do, he'll pass you around the house so he will. Now you're coming, all right, all right, I'm coming. Come on, I'm, are you, come on, hurry up, are you coming? All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. Are you going to take your castor oil? All right, I'll take my castor oil. But I won't shake. <laughs> Finally, there were two men. There was petrol rationing. People don't remember this. Um... But there was petrol rationing in this country not all that long ago, about 15 years ago. And the way it worked was that you drove up to a garage and they gave you a quid's worth, you know. And then you went on to another and you got topped up and so on. And it was a sort of barter in a way because, like, you pulled up to her and you said, have you any petrol? Yeah, OK, I'll give you a quid's worth. That's only because I don't know, I just this stuff. <laughs> she was any good, I'll give you two quid. But anyway, <laughs> this sort of informal thing went on. But there were two men going on to Ballybunion from Dublin for a... Uh, golfing holiday and they were using this system to get down the country they managed to get a pounds worth here pounds worth there they finally got over the carry board and they thought they were safe but they finished up in this village absolutely bone dry not a drop in the tank and uh, the driver got out and he went scouting around and he finally came to this dilapidated looking pub with one dilapidated pump outside it and he went in and he peered around in the gloom and the dinginess inside and he saw a lady behind the counter knitting she was an elderly lady, well, she was an old one. Anyway, he said, uh, excuse me, he said, you have a petrol pump outside. We have, that's right, yeah. Well, he said, have you any petrol? No, we haven't. We haven't a drop. <laughs> but we'll have it in the morning because they promised it. We know the lorry about first thing in the morning. So if you're here in the morning, and of course you will be because you know petrol to go anywhere else, <laughs> we'll fill you up and you'll be, you'll be granted. Well, that means we'd have to stay overnight. Oh, that's right, you figured that out very fast. <laughs> oh, the Dublin man for the brains, that's right, yes. Yes, we'd have to stay overnight. Well, he said, is there a hotel? Ah, what hotel do you want? We give you a bit of breakfast here, for heaven's sake, and good breakfast and bloody, you fix it up in the morning. So they stayed the night anyway, and he got the, they had the breakfast, they got the lorry arrived, and they got filled up, and they went on, and they had a good holiday. And about three months later, the man who had been driving the car came to his friend, and he had a letter in his hand, and he said, listen, do you remember when we had to stop overnight to get that petrol and carry uh, in the dirty old pub? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Hmm, yeah. And he said, now, tell me the truth. I want the truth now. He said, did you go to bed with that old one? He said, well, um... I did, yeah, I did. You did, you bastard. And you gave her my name and address. <laughs> he said, I did, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, he said, you're going to be more sorry now because she died and left me the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, God save you. Put it there, well done. Me and Bobby. <laughs> well, it is the last show. <laughs> It is the last show. Well done, Neil. We'll take a break here. Come back to us after this. Well done, Neil. God save you. Well done. Thank you. Neil, come in.